So, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Mario Passoni, and I'm the head of the Conservation Awareness Project at uh, Friend of the Sea and Friend of the Earth. Here with me, I have uh, Jessica. <laughs> Ciao, Jessica. Welcome to this uh, to our webinar. So, let's start uh, by sharing my screen and uh, with a few rules to be followed. Okay, so um, some uh, I said some rules to be followed to uh, for uh, this webinar. Uh, if you have a question, uh, don't uh, don't speak. Don't uh, turn on uh, your microphone. Just write. On the left bar, there is this uh, button, the questions, that you can write down. And at the end of the webinar, we will answer to all your questions. Uh, only speakers can use audio. And then uh, at the end, uh, recording and uh, PowerPoints will be sent uh, via email link uh, to you. Or otherwise, you can download it uh, or watch it uh, on our website at this link. OK, so today we will talk about uh, bats. The title of uh, this webinar is BATS Conservation Status and Friend of the Earth Programs, Case Study, but World Sanctuary. And with me, as said, uh, I have Jessica Anderson, that is a, a director of education at the BART World Sanctuary. And later, uh, she will introduce, you, introduce us uh, to, to the BART World Sanctuary and uh, their activities. And as said, uh, I'm Maria Passoni, and uh, uh, I'm head of a conservation project. So, um, a reminder, the next webinar will be next month, uh, probably at the end of May, and will be on parrots. Okay, so, uh, let's talk quickly about uh, our society, my society. Uh, I work for the World Sustainability Organization, WSO, uh, that is an international society that deals with the protection uh, of the marine and terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, in order to achieve this result, uh, the WSO has uh, two projects, two main projects. Uh, the first one is a Friend of the Sea, uh, which deal with uh, certification of sustainable products coming from uh, uh, fishing activities. And the other project is Friend of the Earth. Uh, which deal with uh, certification uh, of products from sustainable agriculture and farming. Uh, I have put here also the logo of uh, Dolphin Safe because everything basically started from Dolphin Safe, uh, with which we collaborate, uh, and of which uh, my, my boss, uh, Paolo Brai, is the international uh, director. And uh, the aim of uh, Dolphin Safe is to protect uh, uh, dolphins uh, from uh, tuna fisheries and so on. So um, everything started in 2008, uh, and up to now, over 1,000 companies from more than uh, 1,000 countries uh, worldwide have been certified uh, with Friend of the Sea and Friend of the Earth. Uh, recently, in the last months, uh, we have also expanded uh, our scope of interest, uh, and uh, we decided to create uh, uh, some conservation and awareness uh, projects. Here you can see the list of the project divided for, uh, by Friend of the Sea project and Friend of the Earth project. So we have <laughs> so many different topics in order to, um, that we have developed uh, in order to achieve a concrete result in terms of conservation and awareness. So for Friend of the Sea, we have project about uh, uh, whales, about whale ship strike, about uh, coras, sea turtles, uh, and so on. And about the Friend of the Earth, uh, we have uh, many projects. Last month, we have uh, talked about uh, the one about frogs, uh, the Titicaca uh, giant frog from Peru. We have uh, an international uh, global census uh, about butterflies. And uh, today, we will talk uh, about bats. So just uh, a few information uh, to introduce you to the world of the bats. Uh, first of all, I would say that uh, I really love these uh, tiny animals. I have made my uh, bachelor degree thesis on, uh, on them, so I'm quite happy uh, to discuss about uh, bats today and to host uh, this webinar. So bats, uh, first of all, are not birds and uh, are uh, mammals, and they belong to the order of Chiroptera. They can be, di be divided in uh, two main groups which are called megabats and microbats. So 
in this picture on the right, we can see an example of megabats. Megabats, uh, of course, uh, as the, the word suggests, the name suggests are uh, uh, quite big and for sure uh, mostly bigger than the microbats. And uh, they used to, to feed on fruits uh, and uh, plants and so on. Um, then uh, later I will show you an, a picture of uh, a microbat. Their four limbs are wings and they have a very long spread out digits covered by a thin membrane. And actually, bats are the only flying mammals. Something about the ecology. Many bats are insectivorous, as the one on the right, that is an example of a microbat. And most of the rest are frugivorous or nectarivorous. Uh, so the nectar from the flowers, they feed on this, for example. Apart from the Arctic, uh, the Antarctic and a few isolated uh, oceanic islands, bats exist in almost every habitat on, on, uh, on Earth. Most uh, microbats are nocturnal, that means, uh, as uh, the name suggests, is uh, that they are more active uh, during the night. So you cannot see during the day flying, uh, hunting, uh, feeding, and so on. Uh, and megabats are typically diurnal or crepuscular, so uh, the opposite. Uh, they are more active during the day or uh, uh, are called crepuscular when, they, for example, uh, there is the sunrise. Some uh, interesting uh, information about uh, bats. Microbats use uh, echolocation to detect their prey and obstacles. So, on the picture on the, in the picture on the right, you can have an example. Uh, basically, they can uh, emit sonar waves. When the sonar wave is emitted, they can uh, hit uh, something, for example, in this picture, uh, a butterfly, and uh, get back. The uh, wave that is getting back, uh, that is highlighted by red in this picture, uh, is absorbed. Uh, uh, somehow by, by the bats, and uh, in their brain, they can reproduce uh, uh, exactly what is, uh, what has been eaten by the, the sonar wave, and uh, if it's an, a, a prey or uh, whatever, and they can uh, um, uh, improve the chance to hunt in them or to avoid some obstacle while flying. This is uh, incredible. I really like it. And uh, my thesis uh, was on this. Uh, and what I love of this uh, is that uh, uh, other animals that are living in uh, totally different habitats, uh, they have uh, developed uh, something very similar. For example, uh, I guess uh, uh, not uh, uh, all of you knows that uh, uh, dolphins, for example, or uh, killer whales, orcas, can emit uh, uh, sonar waves too, in order for the same reason, basically, to improve the chance to, to, to hunting and so on. And that's incredible how <laughs> terrestrial animals uh, have developed uh, the, the same methods, uh, systems uh, of uh, aquatic animals. Well, then, then uh, some species can live more than 30 years. Why is impressive this data? Because usually uh, the most is bigger. An animal, the most can live. And the smallest animals are usually living uh, lesser than the others. But this is not uh, uh, valid for bats. But despite their dimension, that can be very, very small, in fact, they can live up to and even more than 30 years. And think that uh, a bat from Siberia uh, has lived 41 years. That's impressive. And then something surprising. You have to know that the most, uh, the fastest mammoth in the world is a bat. It's the Mexican free-tailed bat. It's a quite brand new uh, uh, discover. And uh, it's incredible because uh, before the most, uh, the, the fastest was the, the cheetah, the cheetah, uh, the big cat. Uh, but this bat is faster, 160 kilometers per hour. Impressive. Let's talk now, unfortunately, about uh, the endangered bat species. Yes, because uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of species of bats 
are considered as endangered. That means that uh, they risk uh, the extinction. Uh, so, bats comprise 22% uh, of all classified mammal species worldwide, with uh, around 1,332 1, species. 23 species of bats are critically endangered. What does it mean? That they uh, are uh, very few in numbers and they, and they risk the extinction. The most endangered of these 23 species is estimated to be the Lamotte's round leaf bat. And in 2004, 60 individuals were known. So let's see and find out why they are treated. So let's, go, let's talk quickly about the threats. Uh, first of all, the habitat loss is a major threat to bat species globally. Deforestation for farming, mining, and other human interference is having a significant impact since they de uh, depend on trees, and not only, of course. Here on the right, you can see <laughs> a, a picture, an image of deforestation. Then, uh, larger bats are hunted for their meat. For example, uh, the bat fruit, or fox bat, uh, that lives in the Seychelles is uh, eaten uh, by, uh, by the locals. Uh, White nose uh, syndrome, a fungal disease, threatens bat pol uh, population in the USA and Canada since the winter of 2007. More than seven, uh, uh, I think that uh, more than six million bats have died because of it. And then on the right, you can see a picture that is showing. Uh, uh, all the other uh, threats. So, as you can understand, uh, mainly uh, the threats are due to human activities and interactions. So, uh, why we should uh, preserve and protect bats? First of all, because uh, every animal and every plant in this world has an, an important role uh, in the ecosystem and in the food chain. Uh, if we focus, of course, about, uh, on bats, uh, we can state that they are a key to seed the dispersion and pollination and to fertilize the soil, of course. Uh, the insectivorous bats consume huge quantities of insects and helping reduce the impact on the insect pests on agriculture, for example. And uh, some of them are eating a lot, a lot, a lot of mosquitoes uh, that are not usually really appreciated by humans. And if you think that, for example, mosquitoes, mosquitoes are uh, the most dangerous, dangerous animals for, uh, for humans. Almost every year, 700 million of people died due to uh, mosquitoes because they're bringing, for example, malaria. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's a very dramatic data. So what we could do and what we can do in order uh, to protect uh, bats by our side. So first of all, uh, we should protect their, their habitat. This is important because they, if they do not have uh, a house where to live, a place where to stay, how can they survive? Uh, encourage the use of uh, bat boxes uh, in forests and gardens. Maybe later Jessica will show us uh, an example of bat uh, boxes, but uh, um, is usually uh, wood made and is, uh, they are very, very nice. You can uh, uh, anyway have a look on a Google image and you can have a, an idea about what we are talking about. We should and we have to make awareness and is what we are doing right now in the school, uh, among uh, normal people, uh, uh, industry and uh, farmers and so on, then we, we should uh, uh, reduce or regulate harmful uh, tourism activities in bat caves. Uh, tourism can be uh, a source, a positive source, but can be even negative. Positive if it's well regulated and while, uh, for example, uh, leading the, the, the tourist and the guest uh, uh, looking for uh, caves and bats, uh, you can make awareness on bats. And so you can achieve, uh, achieve uh, results. Negative can be if uh, it's too stressing, for example, uh, for, uh, for bats. 
and uh, or if they create uh, pollution or whatever. So can make a lot of difference. Then uh, we should pro promote and uh, uh, look for sustainable uh, agricultural practices. In this particular case, Friend of the Earth, which deal has said with uh, uh, sustainable agricultural practices, uh, in its requirement, uh, uh, promote uh, the conservation of the bat habitats uh, and other uh, practices that are in support of uh, bats and not only, of course. And then last but not least, of course, uh, support the conservation projects and experts. So, yeah, this is a, a very concrete way to, to protect bats too, because by supporting, by for, what does it mean supporting? It means uh, uh, following on social media, uh, the conservation project, the non-profit, they usually develop this uh, uh, conservation project to share their post and uh, also to donate because most of them are surviving thanks to donation. And a donation uh, can make a difference. So you can decide to, to donate to us, to donate to the Bat War Sanctuary and other uh, asso uh, association around the world uh, in order to give your contribution. Okay, so yeah, this is my part. So let me stop sharing the screen. Uh, we'll give you the control, uh, Jessica. Got it. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to say hello, everyone, and thank you for coming in um, for this presentation. My name is Jessica Anderson, and I am the Education Director at Batworld Sanctuary. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, I can see it. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. So we are Batworld Sanctuary, um, but let's talk a little bit about that. Um, first, I'm going to continue to introduce myself a little bit further and talk about how I came to be in this position in the first place. Um, so a couple years ago, I graduated with my degree in biology. Um, at first, I wanted to go into the medical field, and that was there was no question about it. Um, however, I am also an avid hiker, and I love to visit our nation's national parks. And I, our nation, I mean, in the U.S., that's where we're located. Um, one of these national parks is Carlsbad Caverns National Park. And I actually really love that we talked about um, visiting caves and that how that can raise awareness for bats and the ones that need to be um, saved and the problems that they're going through, because this is exactly what that did for me. I ended up visiting Carlsbad Caverns National Park and my husband and I got there about three or four in the morning. We sat in the complete darkness um, right outside of the cave, which is the bottom left picture. Um, and we got to watch the Mexican free-tailed bats zoom by at about 160 kilometers per hour. And you can literally hear with your ears the zooming sound as they're flying by. And to me, that was just absolutely overwhelming and amazing. And I needed to know everything I could about these animals. Once I started to do a little bit of research, I started to see the difficulties that bats are facing in the environment, mostly due to us humans. And I realized that maybe this is what I wanted to invest my life in. Um, I got extremely lucky because nearby, and that's about an hour and a half away drive from my home, there was this awesome bat sanctuary that was doing this work of saving bats already. So I sent in my application to volunteer and quickly that let me start volunteering here at the sanctuary. Um, over time, I started to fall in love with these bats even more, and I got the opportunity to become their education director. Um, so what is Batworld Sanctuary? What do we do? Who are we? Um, so Batworld Sanctuary is a rescue here in Texas, and we've been around since 1994. Our main goal is to help end the mistreatment of bats. We try to protect wild colonies. We rehabilitate ill, orphaned, or injured bats and those who may not be released are given permanent lifetime sanctuary. And that is the biggest key to um, our work is that if a bat is not able to be released because of a wing injury or a deformity, or because they are non-native and they are fruit bats, they aren't euthanized, they're allowed to live the rest of their lives here. 
So we really could be doing this work with any kind of animal. We could be working with really cute puppies and kittens and why not, you know? So that's the biggest question that I get is why? Why would you focus on bats? And we talked a little bit about this earlier, but bats are essential to the environment. They're a keystone. And if you were to remove them from that food chain, things would become out of control. Um, one of those examples is with mosquitoes. They can eat tons and tons of mosquitoes every single night within one bat colony. Um, they're essential pollinators of the agave and the coconut palm. A lot of our products that we use for cosmetics and even food contain coconut oil, which comes from the coconut palm. And, you know, this is a little tiny bottle of tequila, which a bat helped pollinate that plant to then get us this product, which is a huge economic factor um, in parts of Mexico and Central America. So if we didn't have bats, a lot of those families wouldn't be able to make their money that they need to survive. Um, and we wouldn't have house parties with tequila. Um, they're great seed dispersers for cacao and allspice. So from them, we can get things like chocolate, um, avocado even, and these wouldn't be possible if it weren't for them. They are great insect control, and we did talk about those mosquitoes and how they can um, spread disease, but they can also be great insect control for essential crops. For example, corn. The Mexican free-tailed bat feeds on the corn borer moth, which can destroy crops, acres of them, in one night. And a lot of our products that we use for food, cosmetics, etc., contain some sort of corn oil. So if we if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have all of these products. So we rely on these bats for over 450 commercial products, including but not limited to toothpaste, shampoo, soap, cosmetics, chewing gum, rubber, etc. So if you showered today, if you use deodorant, brushed your teeth, and I really hope all of you guys did, you relied on a bat today alone. So what are we doing to protect these bats? Uh, one of the main things that was started a long time ago was the wild sanctuary and bat castle. So here in our town of Mineral Wells, where Bat World Sanctuary is located, we have lots of old, old buildings. Some of them have even become abandoned over time. And once people moved out, the bats moved in. So one of these buildings in particular, Miss Amanda Lawler, our founder, was able to purchase for $20,000 into this building here in the picture um, because she found that lots of bats were roosting inside and this building was due for demolition. Um, and people in this area did not want bats to be around at all. So these guys have actually been there for over a hundred years and they've been in this town and around the area and they've made this place their home. They've started to use this as a roosting site. They would even use some of the rooms um, as nurseries. So like this room would be where the nursery is. This is where the bachelors are. They had their whole system already done. So Miss Amanda was able to purchase this building and protect the bats inside. However, as the town has been growing and developing, we needed to come up with a solution to these bats in this building because, again, the town was not very happy that these bats were um, just hanging out in their town. And this wasn't the only building that this happened in. So slowly we started to exclude these bats um, out of these buildings so they could be safe and so they weren't killed by the humans who were not happy that they were there. As a solution, we came up with the Bat Castle. It is a safe home for wild, misplaced bats here in Mineral Wells. Another way you could think of this is as a really, really large bat house or bat box. It was actually fashioned after that building in downtown Mineral Wells, the Wild Sanctuary, where those bats were protected for many years. Um, we even tried to make the ceiling similar so that hopefully they can come back and take care of those babies here. Um, we also use this site as a release site. So up in the upper left hand corner, this is a local Mineral Wells man who had his own bat house and had bats in them. 
However, he needed to take that, that box down. And in order to make sure that those guys were released in a safe location, um, we went over to the back castle so he could properly release them and they had a safe place to roost and be. And we still do this. We still use the bat castle um, for any bats that we find around mineral wells. Once they're healthy, rehabilitated, and ready to go back out into the wild to eat lots of bugs, we go back out into the bat castle and release them. So that one's a really cool project that has come about. Um, started way back in the 90s, whenever Bat World was first established, but it's still going on today. And all of this brought about a really cool um, program called Bat World Boot Camp. Now, Bat World Boot Camp is not still functioning, um, but it was brought about by the Bat Castle. When Amanda, our founder, would go out to the Wild Sanctuary to help clean up and take care of any bats that were dehydrated, um, orphans that have been dropped, she started getting her hands full very quickly. So she sent out a call for help for local uh, wildlife rehabilitators, zoologists, researchers, etc., so that they could come down to Mineral Wells, get training on how to deal with these bats and how to feed babies, how to mend broken wings, et cetera. So once those zoologists, conservation scientists, et cetera, started to answer that call, we got Bat World Boot Camp. Um, this happened for about 10 years from the year 2000 to 2010. And our outreach was about 400 people from every single bat inhabited continent in the entire world. Um, so now that this particular program isn't going. We do now have those same people that came to take those classes go back into their original countries and they've been able to train people even further on bat rehabilitation. So the outreach wasn't just here in little mineral wells in Texas, it actually grew even further than that. Um, and I'll actually explain a little bit further how that has continued to help to this day. Um, but now that Batworld Boot Camp is not a thing, we do have our professional development classes with Batworld Mid Cities. Batworld Mid Cities is a satellite of Batworld Sanctuary. She's actually about an hour or so away from us, so not too far, um, but she does run online workshops for wildlife rehab. She has lots of resources on her website for community education programs. Um, and so she also does live classes still, which she is going to have one in May, where she'll come in here to Bat World Sanctuary, and she'll have a small group of people where she will actually teach them how to rehabilitate a bat. Um, so boot camp started this, this little tiny thing. It started with the Wild Sanctuary and just needing extra help. And it turned out to be this huge movement of teaching others how to rehabilitate and then it started a ripple effect, a snowball effect, to then teach others in their own countries how to rehabilitate bats. Now, what is bat rehabilitation and rescue? I've talked about it quite a bit, but I haven't really gone into too much detail. Um, since the year about 2000, because that's when we started to really keep track. So Amanda has actually been rehabbing since the 80s, but we don't have those numbers recorded in detail. But since the year 2000, we have saved over 19,547 injured, ill, or orphaned bats. And most of those have gone back to live in the wilds. And once they're out there, they're eating tons and tons of bugs every single year. Um, now, when they're here, care is provided for both immediate emergency or long-term situations. Um, long-term can be that they're here for a couple of months and they're release back into the wild, or if they're non-releasable, they will stay here at the sanctuary. Those who are not releasable will get to live out their lives here. In this picture, um, he, she kind of ties it all together. This is Puff. She is an orphaned Mexican free-tailed bat who was found in 2005. She was found at that um, the wild sanctuary in Mineral Wells. So once she started protecting that wild colony in Mineral Wells, she was able to start finding these bats who needed help. She found Puff who had a punctured lung and this is why she became completely inflated. Um, 
this isn't seen quite as often. It's kind of a rare case, but what we're able to, to, to do is take a hypodermic needle and puncture, um, make a little hole to kind of let all of the air out and deflate kind of like a balloon. What we found is that wound healed very quickly. So it self-sealed and all that air was released. And once puff was deflated back to normal, we were able to continue care for her, give her antibiotics, pain medicine, lots of food and hydration until she healed completely. So she went from that top picture where she looked like a little Cheeto puff down to looking like a normal orphaned bat. She grew up here and was released back into the wild. And these guys can live 15, 25 plus years eating tons of insects every year. So that one little bat was saved and was able to make a difference. Something else that has come out of the wild sanctuary and boot camp is our rescue locator network. As we were able to find people who were willing to do bat rehabilitation or that took the course here for Bat World Boot Camp, we were able to start a little notebook. It actually started as just pen and paper um, back in the 90s. Now, that concept grew to something similar to Bat Conservation Trust Hotline in the UK. It's not necessarily a hotline, but it is a resource that can be used by anyone, just the general public. And I do invite everyone to go into batworld.org um, so that you can see exactly how this works. But um, all it is is a little map, and you can just type in your zip code. And I actually typed in um, for Dallas in this picture example. And it shows me everyone who is around with those little red markers. It also will show a list of people who is around me, um, in this case, Dallas. We have Jennifer at the very top of the list, and it tells you exactly how many miles away she is. Uh, Kate, right after that, shows me how many miles away she is and their phone number. So anyone can actually see this information. They don't need to contact us so that we can give it to them, although we can and we do every single day. Um, the general public can have access 24 seven to this map. And it began as a tiny log book, which then got transferred into um, an online format. And we have people from different countries all over the world. And it is growing. So it is a little smaller now, but we hope to continue to add people to this map. Another thing that we do is we, so we do take care of those wild colonies with the wild sanctuary, et cetera, but we do also have the pet trade, zoos, and research to think about. Um, bats are sadly a victim to all of these things. They're used in the pet trade because they are so cute and cuddly, um, or at least people think so. But sadly, these animals are not made for the pet trade. Um, they need to have lots and lots of friends, which most people cannot provide. They need to have lots and lots of room, which people cannot provide. And in addition to that, their diet. Um, zoos have also, there's always going to be some good zoos, but we've seen a lot of bad ones that again don't know how to care for them properly. And we'll put them into tiny, tiny cages with their food. And this is actually, these pictures are from a zoo um, and food at the bottom of the ground. So it becomes infested with feces and roaches wounds that are not mended and are left to just heal and most of the time get infected um, and just never heal properly on their own. So all of these pictures came from a zoo situation um, where we were able to rescue, I think over 90 animals from this horrible condition. A lot of them were kept in metal cages, which broke their wings. It was awful. But that is what we do with fruit bats in addition to the wild bats that we care for. Um, how we're moving forward from here. Um, education is our big thing because we can reach a lot of people here in Mineral Wells. We can um, save lots of bats from the pet trade, from zoos, from research, and our wild colonies here locally. But how do we make a bigger impact than that? We have provided lots of free online resources, and that's not just for teachers, but for people who are interested in becoming bat rehabilitators themselves. Our social media outreach has grown. Um, we do run lots of Facebook Lives. I'm usually the one who's running them so that I can show people how awesome bats can be and hopefully help remove a little bit of that fear that most of us have had instilled in us. 
We do have a TikTok as well in order to create bite-sized videos. Um, so usually just a minute or shorter where people can start to learn fun facts about bats. Um, we've also posted lots of games and quizzes on our website um, and Facebook so people can become engaged. We do also uh, have virtual education Zoom courses where I can do something like this, where we are on camera and I'm in the fruit bat enclosure and kids can get to meet some of the bats that we have at the sanctuary without me having to take the bat away from the sanctuary, transport them to a school, stress them out by putting them in front of a group of people, but the kids can still get to see and hear um, a bat. So the Zoom courses have been really successful um, and engaging for kids in this area. Um, and hopefully we can expand that even further to kids across the globe. Educational videos also are also available on our website for rabies and bats in the pet trade. The bats in the pet trade video is very new. Um, and we're super excited about it because um, a lot of people don't know that that's actually one way that us humans are hurting bats. Um, they're being taken out from the wild to then be put into conservatories. Um, and that's usually the name that they operate by, but really they're just breeding bats to then sell them out to the pet trade and zoos. Um, and finally, we have our bat packs, which is part of our education side that we're trying to continue to grow. Um, I do have an example of some of the things that we'll have in the bat pack, which will be made possible through WSO. Um, part of the bat pack will have a Batman's lunchbox. So this is my example of one that I use for my educational Zoom programs. Um, it's just a lunchbox, very simple, but inside we have things that bats can eat. So what would Batman take with him if he took his lunchbox to work? Some bats are carnivorous, a very small percentage, but they can even eat other bats. Some bats eat fruits like bananas or mango. Um, most bats, however, eat flying insects like a mosquito and others my favorites, like the pallid bat can eat things like scorpions or centipedes. And we do have a lot more insects inside the box to show the, that most bats, about 70% eat insects and a smaller amount of fruit to show about 30% of bats eat fruit. And then we only have one item in there that'll be carnivorous, like a fish or a frog or a bat in that case. So we are super excited to get those bat packs out. Um, we do have, hope to have quite a few of them here in the US. We'll also be sending one to Spain, I believe it is. Um, and we're just really excited to see how that works out and to expand that program even further in the future. Let's talk. <laughs> so I did have um, a TikTok video linked in here for us to watch, but I do think we're running short on time. So with that, I will just say, Thank you so much for listening and please visit batworld.org for more information, whether it be on the education side, on the rehab side. And thank you guys so very much. So okay. Sure. Okay. So thank you very much, Jessica. Super interesting. And I really loved the part about tequila. It was impressive. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> drinks apart. No, really. It was really, really interesting. Uh, yeah. So uh, before continuing, I would like to launch a, a poll for our followers. So the question is, what is the best for you, for all of you, what is the best way to protect bats? By supporting conservation projects and experts? by choosing products coming from sustainable agriculture, buying uh, bat boxes, or by making awareness, you can, uh, you can think about it and you can vote. Okay. Uh, yeah, people is voting. Uh, in the meantime, uh, as uh, Jessica was saying, was talking about this uh, bat pack that are super nice, Really, indeed, uh, super nice. Um, basically, uh, WSO and Friend of the Earth wants to um, collaborate and help and support uh, the Bat Sanctuary World. And uh, we will start to help them by uh, buying some of this Bat Pack in order to make awareness in schools. So Jessica was talking also about Spain. Probably, yes, we will start uh, 
a project about schools in uh, in Spain uh, with the collaboration of uh, Leila, uh, that uh, is a colleague of mine, that is uh, dealing actually with uh, uh, this project for Friend of the Earth. So yeah, so stay tuned. In the next weeks and months, uh, you will know more about it, uh, and we will let you know how you can support us and. Uh, of course, uh, how you can support Jessica and their team. So let's show the results of this poll. I know people are still voting. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Here are the results for now. Basically, some votes uh, supporting conservation projects and experts, no one but boxes. <laughs> and make awareness. Most of, the, of our followers make awareness. Yes, I mean, I have put this, uh, these options, uh, all of them are valid, basically. Yeah, maybe uh, are more important the, to support conservation projects and experts, uh, but all of them are important. Maybe a little bit less compared to the others by bad boxes. What do you think about it, uh, Jessica? I honestly, for me, uh, I think mm -hmm. that spreading awareness is the biggest one, but we do need to do a little bit of everything, right? Because spreading yeah. awareness, just it's all talk, but what do you get with it? Um, yeah. So spreading awareness for me as the education person is my biggest one. And that's why I like to focus on kids so that we can kind of deconstruct the fear that they have from bats from being a child with cute stories like the little red bat, which will be yeah. in the bat box as well. Um, but also, I, like, I love to talk to people um, and just figure out what makes them afraid of bats um, and show them how awesome and essential they are to us humans. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. Also, because uh, some, sometimes people think that uh, bats are, are ugly, are bad for us and so on. In fact, in fact, I just got a few questions mm -hmm. from our followers. And the first question is... Uh, are bats dangerous for humans? Uh, would you like to reply? Yeah, so bats are actually the opposite. They are very beneficial to humans. Um, most bats are actually pretty shy. They will not approach you if they're out in the wild and you are there with them. But anything, they'll do anything in their power to avoid you. Um, so where people do become worried about whether bats are dangerous to humans or not, um, are with diseases. So we often think that bats are dirty, rabid, um, and just out to drink your blood, all of which are not true. Um, bats are actually meticulously clean. They spend about a third of their day grooming. Um, most of them will not ever contract the rabies disease. It's, I think it's like half of 1% is the actual um, statistic for that, about how many of them will actually ever contract rabies. Um, and others are also afraid of things like COVID, which has not mm -hmm. been proven that a bat directly gave a person COVID. Um, so that's still being researched to this day and lots of billions of dollars have gone to that to prove that a bat has given a person COVID. But we do think that maybe once upon a time a bat had it and somehow, whether it be through that wet market where lots of animals were put in dirty, nasty conditions all together, that was what happen and get human COVID. But basically, as long as we stay out of their way, as long as we're not putting them in abnormal conditions, um, the bats are not going to give us any kind of disease. Um, and also, they're not physically trying to hurt us. We're not their prey. They don't care about us. Um, even the sanguivorous bats, the ones that drink blood, they're very, very tiny and they don't attack humans. They really go for like livestock or chickens, things like that. Yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. So, uh, um, oh, somebody is uh, leaving a webinar and uh, he, he said, I wanted to ask which would be the some ways of encouraging bat population on rural uh, land, when and how to perhaps position bat boxes and other suggestions and advice. Uh, yeah. Maybe you can answer or... Uh, yeah, Leonardo, uh, sorry, uh, this person, uh, uh, can you eventually, if you have to leave, if you can send us an email, uh, you can find our contact and my contact on uh, our website, uh, and eventually uh, we can uh, answer by, by email. But in the meantime, uh, okay, we'll do. He will uh, send us an email, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. 
can answer that as well, though. Mm -hmm. uh, best sure. way is to plant native plants for whatever your area is, because what those native plants are going to do are attract native insects who feed on the plants. And who feeds on those insects? The bats do. So it's like a cause and effect snowball. Um, so planting native plants is one of the best ways you can do so. It's not a very quick and easy way, but it'll get you to where you need to be. Um, you also need to make sure you have a water source. So whether it be um, a pond or something along those lines, bats need to drink water. Um, so something like that nearby, having lots of bugs, usually through plants, that helps. Um, you can also install a bat house that can give crevice roosters a place to stay. Um, so, so we talked about how there's mega bats and micro bats. There's also another distinction within the insect bats, um, crevice roosters and foliage roosters. Foliage roosters roost in trees. So if you give them lots of trees, you, that might also be a way to attract those. But those foliage roosters are not going to live in a bat house. So giving a bat house is also a way to attract the crevice roosters. Uh, for example, for us, that would be the Mexican free-tailed bat who love to live in old homes, abandoned buildings, caves, and bat houses. Uh, we do have more info on bat houses on our website at batworld.org. Um, so if you would like tips and tricks on how to install it, we do have that available as well. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope uh, he heard the answer. Uh, anyway, we will send him uh, the, this uh, video and presentation. Uh, there is uh, another question. Uh, the last one. What should I do? Hmm. What should I do if I find a bat in my home? This is a really good <laughs> question. Um, and <laughs> what we deal with almost on the daily. Um, so number one, the best thing to remember is no bare hands. So we talked about how bats are more than likely never going to give you a disease. It doesn't mean the chance is zero. Um, and what happens is if you use your bare hands to hold a bat and contain them, a lot of, if, if you are bitten, or even if you just touch them and came into contact with them, a lot of health departments will require that that bat is euthanized and sent out for testing. And the majority of that time, the results come back negative. So that bat died without ever needing to, and they could have mm -hmm. come back down to the wild. So no bare hands. It protects the bat and it protects you because no one wants to be bitten in general. So thick gloves, a towel, that's the best way to go. What you'll do is you'll contain the bat if they're inside your house and they're grounded. You'll put them into a small shoe box. It's actually perfect with little holes for air, but bats can fit in any holes about a half an inch or bigger. So make sure those holes are small. Um, you'll put a small dish of water in there for them and that towel, that small towel that you used, your gloves, you just put those in there so the bat can actually hide. So the whole thing will just go inside the box and you can put a rubber band around the shoe box or a light book something to kind of contain the bat so it doesn't pop open what you'll do next is you'll contact a bat rehabilitator that's us um, or you can use our online uh, find a rescuer um, website which we did talk about earlier which you will just type in your zip code and anyone who's around you will pop up on that list and that list is growing so if any of you are bat rehabilitators yourself give us a call we can go ahead and add you on there if you're willing to become a bat rehabilitator and be on that list. Um, and that's especially useful if you're in the US, but we are growing our um, list of rehabilitators around the globe. Excellent. Thank you very much for this uh, suggestion. Okay, so we do not have other uh, questions for, uh, for now, but uh, anyway, um, for uh, the one who are following us, uh, if you Want to know more about uh, bats or uh, if you have an uh, additional question, you can write us by email and we will be glad to answer you. So thank you very much, Jessica, for your time and your presentation. And uh, thanks everybody for following and have a, a, a good day. Bye bye. Ciao, ciao. Subscribe to our channel to get more content about sustainability.